Greetings Mavericks and new viewers. Tonight, tonight, direct and live, from the Maverick News Network, World Studios. This is Maverick News with Rick Walker. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rick Walker. Welcome back. Hello, Maverick family. Oh, boy. Breaking news tonight. Um, information coming in right up to the last minute here, even though we're starting at the later time tonight. News still coming in just right up until I press the go live button here. Breaking news, Alice Stewart, CNN political commentator, has died suddenly. We'll give you the details. Benny Gantz threatening to resign from Israel's war cabinet, demanding that Netanyahu course a different direction for the war strategy in Gaza. Trump's speaking, has been speaking at the uh, 153rd annual NRA meeting down in Texas, Lone Star State. Let's see if we can bring you some of that. What else do we have tonight? Um, Oh, yes, a worldwide travel advisory has been issued for the LGBTQS plus community. Coming, this uh, travel advisory coming from the U.S. government amid uh, heightened concerns about terrorism. It also highlights some of the, uh, well, I think it highlights the strange nature of politics these days when you have queers for Palestine marching in the streets, and then this travel advisory issued, it makes you scratch your head. So we have all that and more coming up right around the corner. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll get into this story about Alice Stewart dying suddenly. Greetings, brave mavericks. Our quest for truth continues. We go beyond fake news. Together we expose propaganda. Together we pull others out of rabbit holes. We are maverick thinkers. We are all unique individuals, individuals. defenders of individual rights and freedoms. Credible, trusted, grounded in reality. Maverick News, Maverick News. Defending free speech, free speech, speech. Donate at freedomreporters.com. Do it now. Tomorrow may be too late, too late, too late, too late. Maverick News. The world is watching. back. So, tonight, tragic story, Alice Stewart, CNN political commentator, who had uh, worked on a number of GOP presidential campaigns, as a strategist, has died suddenly, 58 years old. I don't really watch CNN, very rarely. I don't think that... Uh, our audience makes up much of the CNN base, that's for sure. But you may be familiar with her. She was uh, often seen on the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. Now, she was found outdoors in the Bellevue neighborhood in Northern Virginia 
um, where she lives and law enforcement officials say they are investigating this. They believe she suffered some sort of medical emergency. And at this point, we're told no foul play is suspected. Of course, a lot of speculation online um, and the information on this was has really just been coming in over the past, well, into, into here over the past half hour. Here's, uh, here's how it looked on CNN when it was announced today. Here's a clip. We have some very sad news to report to you, and I'm very sorry that I have to tell you this. CNN political commentator and Republican strategist Alice Stewart has passed away. Many of you know her. She's been a staple on this network, participating in many political panels, bringing us deep insight into politics. You'll remember she was a former communications director for Senator Ted Cruz. She worked with Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum, Michelle Bachman, just to name a few. And, uh... Let me just pull this down. So as I say, a lot of uh, a lot of posts about this tonight. Um, here's Jim Acosta on Twitter. You probably know Jim Acosta best for his confrontations with Donald Trump. In particular, there was that one incident when he was ended up wrestling for the microphone with a, a young lady who was trying to take it away from him after Trump told him that it was time to move on. Um, so here he is saying, my heart is broken over the passing of our dear colleague Alice Stewart. We've been friends going back to 2012, the 2012 campaign. He says we spent so many weekends talking politics with the wonderful Maria T. Cardona. They always spoke so passionately but with kindness and civility. Alice was my friend and I loved her. Rest in peace. Some images there with Acosta. Now, of course, obviously, people are going to go straight to this. And with the level of speculation out there and it didn't take long for this to show up on social media. Going back and finding this post about um, the thing in the arm. Here it was back in September 10th, 2021, where she says, I am fully vaccinated, not sure why others do what they do. And this post from MU Truth Ultra says, she was found outdoors early this morning. I'm sure it has nothing to do with that tweet back from September of 2021. And let's take a look at her Twitter feed, the Twitter feed of Alice Stewart. This appears to be the last post that she made on Twitter, X. <clears throat> Just yesterday, she um, was there with Wolf Blitzer. Says, I will always enjoy joining Wolf Blitzer on CNN Talking Politics with mi amiga, Maria Ticardona. And yeah, that was just yesterday. And that appears to be her very last post on X. So what exactly happened? We do not know. I'm sure we will find out more over the next day or two. Information will no doubt be coming up because there's such a, a high level of interest in this. 58 years old, otherwise appeared to be healthy and 
now no longer with us. A tragic turn of events, 58 years old. Let me see where we're at with this. Um, we're going to move on here. Let me see where we are at with Donald Trump. Let me just requeue this. So, I believe he's wrapped up his speech there, but we're going to requeue. Just going to bring you a little bit um, from his address in Dallas. Here we go. Yeah. All right. We've got it. Here we go. Policy Institute and the NRA brought it to a Dallas. level that nobody thought possible and fairly quickly too, I would say. Uh, Brooke Rollins. Brooke. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. She could run any company in America, but I don't want to say that because I don't want her stolen away from me. Texas legislature candidates who have my complete and total endorsement. David Covey, Alan School, Alan Schoolcraft, where is Alan? Alan Schoolcraft, Helen Kerwin, and Brent Hagenboo. Where are you? Stand up. Oh, there they are. And David is uh, leading very substantially an absolutely terrible Speaker of the House who didn't want to go into voter fraud. He didn't want to do it. And David is, David, raise your hand, David, because David's leading very, very substantially against your, against your Speaker of the House. And uh, I see the recent polls, but still, it's about a week away. They all have my complete and total endorsement. They're phenomenal people, and they're going to do really, really well. And we appreciate you being with us. Thank you. And good luck in a week from now. Good luck. You're going to win big. You're all going to win big. We have to get, we have to get your speaker out of there so that we can go into voter fraud. Because, you know, even though we win Texas, Dallas and Houston, those areas, uh, a lot of bad things happening, right, Dan? You know, they have a lot of bad things happening, and we got to stop it before it gets out of control, and they will do that. Also, a man, you know, he was operating a piece of equipment, a big, big uh, hauler, a big truck. He was a truck guy, a real truck guy, not like Biden. You know, Biden says, I drive trucks. <laughs> I drive trucks. I used to drive an 18-wheeler. He doesn't know what he said. He didn't. No, he always says that. He said, I used to drive an 18-wheeler. When the truckers come in, that's what he says. When the pilots come in, I used to fly a plane. <laughs> no, it's true. He's misinformation. I was going to say he's full of bullshit, but I don't want to use bad language because there are a lot of young... No, I don't want to... I don't want to do that. Well, I played golf today with a really good golfer, Tony Romo. Do you know Tony Romo? He may be a better golfer than a football player. I don't know. But we played really today. We were talking about the state. We were talking about a lot of things, and we were at a wonderful course very nearby, and we had a tremendous amount of support from the people at that, that club. I'll tell you, it's amazing. They love this state. They love your governor, your lieutenant governor. They love... This country, it's a beautiful thing to see, really beautiful. But you know, Biden, uh, he said his biggest lie of all, because I'm a nice golfer, is the expression. He goes, we have another nice golfer here, by the way, Mr. Steve Whitkoff and his son Alex. He's a nice golfer, and he's one of the most successful businessmen in the country. He flew in just to spend some time because he's a big believer in the NRA. But Biden, his biggest lie of all, he said he's a 6.2 handicap golfer. <laughs> this guy couldn't break 200. I really made it. 
And he actually challenged me, you know, last week we had, we're going to have debates with him, and that was good. That's good. I think we're going to, you know, he's still looking for that white stuff that was found in the White House. He said, where is, it never arrived. It never arrived. They can't find it. Everyone thought it was for Hunter. Maybe it wasn't for Hunter. I think it was for somebody else. But he said 6.2, you know, so usually it guys a six or a seven or an eight. Or, I, I played golf for a long time. I won a lot of golf. 31 club championships, can you believe it? And he challenged me to a golf match. He said, I'll give him three aside. The guy can't break 200. Here's his swing. I said, I'm very good at imitating swings. It's not just mm. oh, no. Well, you ask Tony Romo about that. He'll tell you about Trump. But, uh, no, but that's his biggest lie, 6.2. It's got to be 6.2. You know why? 6.2 is, like, totally accurate, you know? Down 0.2. I never even heard of that before. Who's a 6.2? <laughs> but this gentleman that is from North Carolina got up and made a speech, and the place said, why aren't you running for office? And he gave it a shot. He ran for lieutenant governor. So he went from a truck, tractor. He was a very good operator right here. It was a forklift and a good one, a big one. And he had a great job, but he made a speech. I think he was protesting taxes or something in North Carolina. And he took the place by storm. One of the most beautiful, resonant voices you've ever heard. He stood up. I, I said, I, I hope I said, I think I'm going to really insult him by saying this. It's possible that I will, and I didn't want to do that. And you know, we're doing well with the black voter. They can't even believe it. They love Trump, and I love them. But I said to this man, and when he endorsed me, he gave a speech, and I said, you are Dr. Martin Luther King on steroids. That's how good you are. You are unbelievable as a speaker, and he got up and he's doing fantastically well in North Carolina, and I think he's going to be the next governor of North Carolina, Mark Robinson. Okay, we're gonna pull out of that and maybe come back to some more of that later on, I don't know. It's kind of, uh, at this point, routine stuff coming from him. I'll check into it and see if there was anything earth-shattering that was said there. If so, I'll bring it to you. But right now, we're going to move on to some of the more um, important stories of the night. Um, not that Trump isn't important. It's just, you know, he keeps giving these speeches, and we keep hearing a lot of the same things over and over again. Uh, I guess perhaps the, one of the other huge stories out there tonight is what's going on in Israel, the state of Israel, according to War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz, is heading for the rocks. He says uh, a small minority of zealots has taken the helm, and he is at odds with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He says... Once a leader and an Israeli patriot has enabled him to do so, putting his personal and political interests ahead of the existential needs of the state. That's what he's saying about Netanyahu tonight. He is uh, demanding a change in direction for Israel's war strategy in Gaza. The National Unity Party leader, a former IDF chief of staff who failed Repeatedly in recent years to unseat Netanyahu at the ballot box has joined forces with him in an emergency war coalition. But even though he did that days after Hamas's devastating invasion in uh, southern Israel back on October 7th, there has been a rift there between the two. And it is very public right now. He, uh, Gantz thinks that what is going on in Gaza is a disaster for Israel. 
So he did address the nation in a televised address. And uh, he is demanding, well, there's a list of demands, really. And while all this is going on, protests have erupted again in the streets of Israel and Tel Aviv. This is what it looks like there, or it did look like just a short time ago. Massive crowds demanding the resignation of Benjamin Netanyahu. Here it is. <laughs> Now that's been going on for some time. We've shown you video of these protests in the past, and this is, uh, it's got to be a major concern for Netanyahu, but the, uh, the truth of the matter is, Netanyahu still has the support that he needs politically to continue with the current strategy. So obviously you, you have a number of factors coming into play here. You have the frustration of the public. You have this rift between Benny Gantz and Netanyahu. So instead of having a unified voice and a unified front right now, um, you're getting division. And some of that has to be politically motivated. And some of it has to be the result of genuine disagreement over the kind of strategy that is being employed. I mean, on the face of it, Gantz has more political leverage than people probably realize. But, um, I don't know, it's... it's uh, it's, it's a little difficult to read this because even though you have these massive protests, I'm not sure that what you see in the streets is necessarily a reflection of what the public attitude is or where the level of public support is one way or the other overall within the country. And I'm not sure how organic or natural those protests are in the streets when it comes to something like this, especially during a time of war. You have to think that there, there absolutely has to be some element of political um, motivation or involvement, maybe even outside political or outside state interests who are fueling these protests because we're seeing it go on all around the world all the time now. These protests are rarely entirely organic. They are, uh, they, it's a combination usually of an organic thing where it just happens naturally and then it's helped along with social media propaganda and information warfare. So how much does that come into play here? I really don't know. But we need to be aware of it. And so I think it's uh, I think Gantz is saying that he will resign uh, by June 6th if there is not a change in direction in with that war policy, the war strategy in Gaza. And a lot of this is uh, actually I think it's June 8th. Um, this is the day that he has cited and. A lot of this is, is about the hostages that are still in custody. Many feel that Netanyahu isn't doing enough to get them back. And, of course, you have the issue of public opinion, world public opinion, and Israel's image globally because of the way that Israel has responded since October 7th, which I said from the beginning was it was an issue I said that if you go in too hard if you respond with with a massive military presence in Gaza 
and you do what he did, I said, you're going to lose in the court of public opinion. It's a trap. And you're seeing that play out right now. So we'll continue to monitor that for you. Um, back home here in Canada, I was sad to see this today, and I was not aware of this until this was just recently posted by Kareem Assad, who is a lawyer and represents someone I'm sure you are all familiar with out there, Chris Dacey, who has been on this program. He is a, a live streamer, influencer, social media um, YouTuber, X, he's very prominent on X, Twitter right now. He was assaulted. I'm sorry to tell you. And uh, here, there's uh, an image of what happened to Chris Dacey of Dacey Media. These protests are getting more and more unpredictable and even violent at times, but he wasn't assaulted at a protest in this case. He was apparently assaulted and robbed by masked assailants, according to this post in Ottawa's Confederation Park. This goes back uh, to May 17th, around 6 p.m. In this post from Kareem Assad, she says that her client was attacked and that the attack appears premeditated and may constitute intimidation of a justice system participant. It goes on and says, Joe Morin from the Deanna and Joe podcast was first to publicly mock the victim online. It says here, his co-host Deanna Sheriff is in jail awaiting trial on nine serious charges, including assault, police with intent to prevent arrest, assault with a weapon, and hate-motivated harassment. And then there's a request here from Kareem Assad. If you have videos, photos, or can help identify the perpetrators, please reach out to me through private direct communication. Alternatively, contact Ottawa Police at 613-236-1222, extension 7300. And you can see that Chris Stacy has a bit of a shiner there. Looks like he was punched in the eye. Or at the side of his face is all swollen around his eye in that photograph. Boy, politics is a tough business these days. Rudy Giuliani, 80 years old today. It's his birthday. You all know Rudy Giuliani. He used to be uh, America's mayor. Beloved. Especially after 9-11. That's when he really rose to prominence. Different times. Isn't it interesting how uh, an American hero, an American icon, who becomes involved with a presidential campaign, personal friend of Donald Trump's, ends up being targeted by the state. Here he's making headlines tonight across mainstream media and independent media and pro-Trump media because he went online and was sort of mocking the Arizona Attorney General who has been coming after him as you can see here on this headline from NBC News. He was indicted back in April on charges related to a conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election results in Arizona. So today, I guess he earlier in the day, posted online and um, said, let me see if I can find the exact words because the tweet itself is being deleted apparently. And he said, he basically said that they couldn't find him and that they couldn't find him to serve him the papers on the indictment. Oh, here it is right here. <laughs> Quote, if Arizona authorities can't find me by tomorrow morning, one, they must dismiss the indictment. 
two. They must concede they can't count votes. And yeah, so he posted that Friday night, last night. Accompanying the message was a photo of himself smiling with six other people and balloons floating in the backdrop at his, uh, I guess, his birthday celebration. And then an hour and 14 minutes later, so I'm sorry, this was actually last night that this happened, not today, as I stated earlier. An hour and 14 minutes later, it says here, May has responded to Giuliani's post, writing, The final defendant was served moments ago. At Rudy Giuliani, nobody is above the law. So... His birthday is actually on the 28th of this month. I guess he was just having an early birthday celebration. And he was enjoying the company of his friends. Posted that online. And then they came and they found him. And they served him with those papers. Targeted. Making an example of him. Wow. That isn't the only court case that he's involved with, of course. He's, uh, he was hit with a $148 million verdict for defaming two Georgia election workers back into December of 2023. And I know, I know that since then he has been having some financial struggles. That is part of the strategy politically, isn't it? Cripple Trump's supporters with lawfare and financially. And here's a guy who served his country in a variety of capacities, used to go after organized crime figures with some pretty successful prosecutions, sending some pretty high profile criminals to jail and now being targeted by the country that he himself served I would say so well for so long, but not a very popular guy now just because he got involved with Donald Trump. Okay, stay with me. When we come back, we're going to tell you about this travel advisory for gay people. The New World Order Government Overreach The Great Reset Mainstream Media Lies Now more than ever, independent voices are needed. Donate now, at FreedomReporters.com That's FreedomReporters.com Maverick News The Antivirus Program For Your Mind Okay, folks, I am back, and the State Department in the United States has issued a travel alert for LGBTQS plus people who might be traveling abroad, um, specifically, you know, especially if they're planning to go to any events that are identified as LGBTQS plus events. This is a worldwide caution alert issued, and they're concerned about citizens overseas. They're telling people to exercise increased caution 
because of an increased potential for foreign terrorist organization-inspired violence against LGBTQS plus um, or LGBTQIS plus persons. They keep adding letters, and I'm sorry, I just, I don't know. There's no way for me to be accurate with it anymore, if it ever was. Um, so the alert is connected with the that recent announcement from the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security about terrorist organizations that might might exploit LGBTQS plus related events and venues, including some of these uh, events which are coming up because of Pride Month, which begins in June. And we've seen warnings as well from U.S. officials about ongoing concerns. They, there's a heightened risk of terrorist attacks, in their view, from the FBI. We've heard this um, with, within the United States itself as well. And so, of course, a lot of concerns about um, what might happen to people abroad if they are gay or lesbian, um, bisexual, transgender, if they're at any events that are LGBTQIS plus related. And that is because, obviously, with the way the political situation is developing in the Middle East and the rise of, I guess, support for Islamic ideology and the religion and the belief system that comes along with that. There's a strong anti-gay, anti-LGBTQS plus bias or a high level of prejudice against people from those communities. So they may be targeted. And in the Middle East, in these some of these countries, if you are gay, the way the law works there is you could actually be put to death. Uh, they, they, they literally will, in some cases, kill you. And so that is what you're up against, which is why the... The progressives who are out there marching in the streets in support of what's going on in Gaza with Hamas and siding with Hamas, and you have queers for Palestine, it, it really defies logic. Uh, and the government is coming right out and warning you. They're telling you, be careful. Because if you travel, especially if you're outside the country, and you go to any of these kinds of events, you are at risk. So, just letting you know. Some uh, other kind of crazy stuff out of Canada tonight. You know, um, there are these little eels. I don't eat them. Um, but they're called, um, Elvers. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just out of the loop when it comes to this kind of seafood. This is the, uh, the most expensive kind of sea. This is the most expensive seafood harvested as part of the, the, you know, the Canadian fishery in Canada. Um, nothing's more expensive than this stuff. And there is a restriction this year on fishing for elvers, little tiny eels. So I guess quite a few fisher people have been out there fishing for these things, and they just confiscated um, elvers with an estimated, I'll say, street value, like drugs, of about a half a million dollars, these things get shipped off to Asia. They catch them when they're little tiny baby eels. 
and then they ship them overseas, still alive, and they grow to maturity, and then they they become dinner <laughs> for people over there. It's a kind of a delicacy, I guess. This is, as I say, the most expensive kind of fish that or seafood that you can buy. And so the um, officials at the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans say this is confiscation, seizure of more than 100 kilograms of unauthorized elvers is very significant, and they are using this particular case to highlight the magnitude of the problem that they have because in March, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans announced there would be no elver fishing this year due to safety and conservation concerns. And so far this year, they've now made 149 arrests and have seized roughly 207 kilograms of elvers. So this seizure at the Toronto airport, Pearson, represents about half of all the elvers confiscated or seized so far this year. Here's um, an image released by the authorities. <clears throat> and while this information is being released today, the seizure actually happened back on the 15th of the month. I was not even familiar with them. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look in the chat here first. Have you guys ever heard of these things before? Do you anybody ever eat these things? Elvers? Anybody eat these things? Elvers? I'm just looking in the chat. Let me know. Elvers, Elvers, Elvers. These are little mini eels. I I honestly I was not aware. I I don't really like the way eels look. I don't think I could eat it. But a lot of seafood is pretty darn ugly until you um, until you clean it up and, you know, fillet it and then cook it. Then it's pretty good. Am I rich, says Uncle Dude? No. <laughs> I don't even, I don't, I see some people saying no, they've never, never heard of them. And uh, Magic Moon says, are the elvers illegal? Well, this year, there's not supposed to be any fishing for elvers allowed. And uh, anybody else? I'm going to look up some. I'm going to see if I can find some video so I can show you what these things look like. Elvers, little mini eels. Elvers and here we go. I think we've got, uh, yeah, we can show you some of this. Here's, um, I don't want to show you this. There might be a copyright strike on that. Um, they're like baby eels is what they are. I think I can show you some of this. Okay. This is like a fishing show thingy. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. The eels creep me out. They're like water snakes to me. Here we go. A lot of money into the state of Maine. $20 million. Jeez. This is a Maine today. The last eels are, I think, they're the same things. Yeah, yeah probably. Three, four thousand dollars there. Four thousand dollars worth of eels. I don't know if they're the same. These are glasses. They do the same thing. Those are cool looking. They're like little semi transparent worms. You eat worms and be happy. Gold Rush of Maine. What is up, guys? Joe Holland here. It is before 3 a.m. in the morning. I gotta wipe the sleep out of my eyes. I am heading to the coast to see about how to catch and everything you need to know about elvers. What's an elver? 
you're gonna find out. Oh, there goes a fox. <laughs> been a little while since I've been on the road before 3 a.m. We're gonna head to where fresh and salt water meets to meet up with my buddy Abdin, who's gonna teach us all we need to know about Elvers. Here we Abdin go. is all set up on a retaining wall on a freshwater river that meets salt water. So he's fishing a high tide. He has an aluminum pulled net, a foam pad to sit on, and a bucket for the glass eels that he catches. Near the water, he has a propane lantern to attract the glass eels and elvers. The eels come in from the ocean towards the fresh water on the high tide, and Abdon blindly swings his net to scoop and catch them as they come up the river. The American eel is unique because it's the only catadromous fish in North America, meaning it lives mostly in fresh water but returns to the ocean to spawn, as opposed to anadromous species that live in salt water and travel to fresh water to spawn. Adult eels may live in fresh water from 8 to 25 years before returning to the ocean to spawn. They leave their freshwater growing areas in the fall and migrate to the Sargasso Sea and spawn during the late winter. The Sargasso Sea is a large area of the western North Atlantic located east of the Bahamas and south of Bermuda. It's actually just an area of the North Atlantic that's full of sargassum, which is a kind of seaweed that floats in the ocean rather than existing close to land. For the American eel, the Sargasso Sea is where the life cycle begins and ends. After spawning, the adult eel dies. The eggs hatch after several days and develop into a larva stage. The larvae drift in the ocean for several months and then enter the Gulf Stream current to be carried north towards the North American continent. As they approach the continental shelf, the larvae transform into miniature transparent eels called glass eels. As glass eels leave the open ocean to enter estuaries and ascend rivers, they are known as elvers. This migration occurs in late winter and early spring. Oops. Sorry. Long history in that. Maine, having occurred since the earliest colonial settlements. The elver fishery is relatively recent, having begun in the early 1970s until 1978 and then started again in the early 1990s. The fishery was non-existent from 1979 to the early 1990s due to a collapse in market demand for elvers. In recent years, market demand has increased dramatically. Elvers are highly valued in the Far East, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Korea, where they are cultured and reared to adult size for the food fish market. Due to recent intense market demand, elvers have now become the most valuable marine resource in terms of price per pound, reaching over $2,000 per pound. The fishing season for elvers in Maine runs from March 22nd through June 7th. Although the fishery may be closed earlier if Maine's quota is met. Harvest methods are restricted to hand dip nets, like Abdon is using, or fike nets. The Department of Marine Resources has renewed a lottery for permits, but they are capped at 425 licenses. Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating thing. No weather. South Carolina is the only other place that they harvest them and they only harvest uh, aquaculture for them. Huh. It's the only state in the country that harvests them like this commercially. It's been a fight to keep it. A lot of the other states haven't done the work that Maine has to keep the fishery. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty jealous. I mean, it's a short season, it's 11 weeks, and it creates. Twenty million dollars worth of revenue for the fishermen. Wow! <clears throat> last year, last year I think the season was done middle to the end of April. So it was only like five weeks. Oh, it's quota based. Yeah, it's quota based. I, I'm only allowed so many. Um, the state of Maine is allowed to have us. I think it's nine hundred ninety-six hundred thirty-seven pounds. 2012, 2013, he was harvesting somewhere around 18,000 pounds. Wow. So they've tried like crazy to cut us back to nothing, but they've cut us back 50% of what we was catching. 
to all the Atlantic states. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is what regulates a lot of this stuff, and um, it's all it's the whole all 13 states along the eastern seaboard. They make up these rules. Same thing with pogies, stripers, everything. Flounder, herring. I've been down to this middle one on top right there. Hmm? He, he just went he's heading towards the light. <laughs> oh yeah. I think I go. I think I saw. Yep. Yep, he's, he's just coming out back up right now. Oh yeah. Yep, yep plain as day. Yep. Yep, he's gonna have to go. Oh another one. Right in front of the light. You got him. That's cool. Yeah, it's fun when you see, you'll see four, five, six women right by your light, right steady. You just stay right on top and just dip them. You know that that's when there's usually quite a few below it. It's when they're swimming by you. Now, are they all coming from the ocean? Yep, yep. All the way from the Bermuda Triangle. Holy cow. From the Sargasso Sea. Yeah. All the adults will go down there from here and all over. Spawn and the babies come back. The crazy thing about these are they're not a river specific species. So you could get 10,000 pounds or you could get 2,000 pounds. Huh. It all depends on the uh, fresh water content. That's what they seek out is the fresh water. These will head up towards the big Madomic, little Madomic, Washington Pond. Live their life until they're ready to go back out. And there wasn't very many people doing it. There was, you know, just a handful. I get started in 91, when the big boom really hit. And they went to like $400 a pound. There was like 2,000, 2,200 people that had licenses at that time. Wow. Back when I started, all you needed was a uh, commercial fishing license. And then a few years after that, they created the outdoor license. But anybody could still buy one. Oh, man, these I'm things are like worth their weight in gold. 2012, 2011, something like that, that they put the moratorium on. But they've dropped off. This cold weather just fetched them right out. I, there again too, so it's really really early and I could have caught just what was here They've been laying here wait for the water temperature to get to a, what they like Because they dropped right off last night. I, I only had a half a pound or so They're pretty pretty slow tonight too The temperature makes a big difference. They don't like moving in this cold cold water if it was 50 degrees during the day, mm -hmm. they would be all over the place. No, I see nets out here. Does that have anything to do with these? Yep, that was my wife's net right there, actually. I see those net. Yep, I set it so it was close so she could get to it easy. And they'll go in and get stuck in there? Yep, yep. There's a, what they call a caught end. There's a funnel, like a funnel in the net that goes down and they go into a, something about the size of my bucket, about three feet long. They get in there and they get stuck in there. <laughs> yeah. Is this? There's another one there. A little better. I figure. One year we had them, it was around 2,200 a pound. They're close to a buck a piece for those right there. Whoa. Right now they're, yeah, probably 80 cents. 80 cents, 90 cents a piece. Wow, nice. I'm in the wrong business. Well, no, no doubt about that. <laughs> It's like, um... It takes a lot of them to make up a pound. It's like aquatic gold. Uh, every, that's why they, a lot of times they only move at night. Because anything and everything wants to eat them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to eat them either, does it? Nope. Like a minnow could get them. Yep. Back in 2012, 2013, they had... 
50, 60 times, and then that's... Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, some of you guys made 100, 125,000 in a night. Oh, my God. One night. Was there no quota then, or...? There was no quota then. Yeah, I was... Back then, I was... I didn't chase them like a lot of guys did. A lot of guys go all the way to Bangor, to uh, Machias, and places like that. You chase them up the coast. Because as they come up, they'll come into these rivers at different times. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of them guys would chase them and catch them all, all season. But they predominantly just stayed around here, fish here, fish over in the sheep's gut because you could leave here at high tide, go over there and still fish for another hour and a half, two hours because the tide's so late up there. Mm -hmm. and fish over there and get another pound, pound and a half. A lot of guys used to go to New Jersey and Massachusetts and New Hampshire back when there was no quota and there was really... It was the Wild West. You should start early and go down, down there and chase them up through. I had a place in one year we didn't have our... We chased them up to Bangor. And uh, I had a place that I sat. It was right where the old fish ladder was, right across from the hospital power plant there. And one day we took a, took a boat up because it was the easiest way to get to a lot of places because the... the uh, there's a long ways through the woods to get to the river and the road. And I had a wall like this. <clears throat> and I turned my light on and there was a band of them about two feet wide and it was just nothing but eels for hmm. 300 yards. And oh my God. following that wall right down through. I got like six pounds in like <laughs> two hours. It was crazy. It's getting a little better. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's getting a little better. It's starting to move. Throughout my screen. I have to take, clean them when I get home. Almost. Do you get much for like competition? Not, not now. It used to be a little bit years ago. Um, a lot of guys were. That was another thing we did too. Is uh, you was allowed to uh, switch at the beginning of the year whether you wanted a fight net or a dip net. Oh. Because for pre 2016 or so, you. Uh, Whatever you've ever always fished with, that's yeah. all you was allowed to have. Okay. You know, some guys would have, before 2012 or so, you was allowed as many nets as you wanted. Wow. And then the, 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 they started regulating it. They dropped you down to five nets. Okay. And then they went to, if you had fish five fight nets, you could fish up to two fight nets. And then it was switched to a dip net and a fight net if you wanted to fish it. Or if you just had a dip net and that's all you ever fished with, that's all you was allowed. But now, we redid it so uh, you can have whatever you want at the beginning of the season, uh, but you're stuck with it for the season. Okay. And I've always dipped. I always loved dipping. My wife wound up switching to a fight net. She doesn't want to be down here all hours of the night. <laughs> She's good at it, too. Dipping. Yeah. She's real good at it. But yeah, no, I've had this spot for... A long time. Once in a while, you'll have. It's not now, but back years ago, you used to have people come down and try to get this spot on you. They know what you're doing. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, okay. So there you go. Elvers. Never heard of them before. You know what I had heard of is uh, smelt. When I was a kid, my uncle had a cottage down at Port Stanley on Lake Erie. And they used to have all kinds of get-togethers down there. And at certain times of the year, the, they would have, the, the smelt would run in Lake Erie. And everybody would go down to the cottage, family, friends, and they would have, um, uh, they, they'd go fishing for smelt uh, out just off the beach. People would wade out into the, everybody would wade out into the water, catch smelt, and then they'd have a, a feast, a smelt feast. Um, let's see if we can pull up a little bit of video to show you what smelt are like. Here's, this is from some time ago. Um, different regulations on each side of the border in terms of what you're allowed to do with smelt. This is not... A species apparently that is native to the Great Lakes but they were intentionally stocked back many years ago 
and they've become part of the ecosystem, uh, part of the Great Lakes ecosystem. And here we go. Here's a look at uh, what smelt looked like in Lake Erie. Let's go ahead and show you what I'm using here. Got, uh, I'm using three hooks. <clears throat> number 10 hook, number 10 hook, and a little ice jig on the bottom. About three and a half, four feet down. Just whip it on out there. <clears throat> Not too bad so far. I never, I never went fishing. I was too young at the time, but everybody would go out fishing and it was always at night. They would come in close to shore. There he goes, the cop went. So I remember everybody used to wade out into the water to get them out there. This guy's just sitting right on shore. Fish on! That's from uh, Easy Bite One. That's the name of the channel. Smoke fishing in Lake Erie. And let's get a little information on smelt. In case you're wondering about that and what that's all about. Here's the Ontario government. What you need to know about the rainbow smelt includes habitat identifying features and what you can do to reduce its impact. The rainbow smelt is a predatory fish native to the North Atlantic coastal regions of North America and a few lakes in the Ottawa Valley and the St. Lawrence River watershed. Deliberate stocking in Michigan in the early 1900s led to established rainbow smelt populations in Lakes Erie, Michigan, Huron and Superior. The fish likely invaded Lake Ontario from the Atlantic coastal areas through the Erie Canal. More recently, people have illegally introduced rainbow smelt to inland lakes. In their native habitat, rainbow smelt spend most of their lives at sea and migrate into fresh water to spawn. Rainbow smelt that have invaded Ontario waters cannot return to the sea, but they still follow old behavior patterns. In the spring, they move in large schools from lakes into streams and along shorelines to spawn. Rainbow smelt eat plankton, small animals and plants found in the water, as well as the young of native fish species. So yeah, these are not native to the Great Lakes, as I said earlier. But people eat them, and I think that this year there might be some sort of an advisory in place about eating them in some locations. Um, I think there is a concern, maybe in Lake Superior. Let me just check on that for you. I don't want anyone to get sick. Um, there's an, just checking to make sure that, see if there's an advisory. At, at the very least, I would say if you're going to go smelt fishing, or for any fish, check to see if there are any advisories out there. Um, yeah, I don't see anything here. I thought there was one. Oh, there is something here. Oh, that's from a couple of years ago. Okay, so it's old. But I would still advise... Uh, check thoroughly to see if there are any advisories regarding any maybe potential health issues when you go out and, and fish for any of these 
any kind of fishing, really. Just make sure you're educated and you know what's going on. Because that was back in 2021. There was an advisory about eating fish out of uh, Lake Superior smelt, specifically. So, there you go. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll come back on the other side. Don't go away. Feel the vibrations. Our quest continues. The truth is out there. The information war is raging. Truth without integrity is worth nothing. Maverick News. Because those who have power and those who seek it must be held accountable. The world is watching. Join our family of truth seekers. Donate today and add your voice to the chorus of Maverick Knights. Donate at maverickdonations.com. Truth. Integrity. It's the Maverick way. Maverick News. The world is watching. Okay, we're back and just want to talk about um, this. It's a kind of a, I don't know if it's a political story, a financial story, a little bit of both. I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, this. It's sort of an alternative bank that was set up. It's a, it's a newer Canadian bank. Um, and it was started by Chinese Canadian banking mogul Shanglin Jian. And he's launched a $300 million lawsuit against the federal government. And this is because he came sort of, he's been on the um, government's radar. And they've been obviously keeping an eye on this guy. And he's the founder of Wealth One Bank. And... He was like the darling of a lot of Canadian politicians for quite a while who have been holding him up and as an example of, you know, someone who came to Canada and made uh, a fortune, uh, made a real success of himself, but now sort of targeted by CSIS, Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. Here, I'm going to show you the headlines here. This is... Uh, this is just one of the headlines. The story now getting a lot of traction. Because this guy's been, well, you know how they froze the bank accounts of people in the Freedom Convoy? This guy, similar kind of treatment by the federal government. He's been excluded, shut out of the Canadian economy, as it says here in this headline. Um, so this guy can't even get, you know, a credit card anymore. So he's gone from running, starting and running a, uh, this new bank in Canada. And now he can't even get a credit card himself. So he has this $300 million lawsuit. His lawyer 
is Joel Etienne, who says, my client, Shanglin Jian, was a victim of mass dissemination of false information that went into the public record. He goes on and says, what we're trying to do is get to the truth. What we want is transparency and what we want is full vindication. So this is a statement of claim that's been filed in Ontario Superior Court. It was filed on May 8th, and it names the Attorney General of Canada, the Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, the RCMP Commissioner, and the Globe and Mail. An ex-Mountie and former CSIS director who worked together, it says here, at the consultancy firm Critical Risk Team are also named in the suit. And the allegation here is that he has been banished from the economy. The lawsuit goes on and alleges that CSIS was fully aware that human sources, this is a quote, human sources can be mired by racial, xenophobic, and ethnic biases, yet the public assumes information from CSIS is reliable, which makes these leaks, this information leak from CSIS, particularly damaging because some of this information did come out from CSIS and then it obviously was reported in the mainstream media and this guy's reputation was obviously affected and, and in addition to that, the government has taken actions against him so he can't get, I mean, you're, you're worried about getting credit. This guy can't even get credit and he was running the bank. Says the claim states that the Jean has been effectively banished from the Canadian economy. He's 69 years old. And he's been forced to divest from the bank he built, Wealth One Bank, which caters to new Canadians. The bank has been forced to lay off staff after losing customers, and Gian says he can't even get a bank card. Huge fall from grace. Of course, we don't have all the information, and as this thing makes its way through the courts, I would imagine we will find out more. A lot of concerns out there right now about foreign interference in our political system and maybe now even our financial system. But this person says he's basically innocent. So no charges late, it says here. Although the lawsuit was filed more than a week ago, the Attorney General of Canada has yet to be served with a statement of claim and therefore hasn't determined its next step. And as for CSIS, well, a spokesperson for CSIS says it would be inappropriate for the agency to comment on the matter if it's before the courts. And they continue to investigate the unauthorized disclosure or leaks of classified CSIS information to the media in parallel and in coordination with other government organizations as well as the RCMP criminal investigations CSIS says it takes allegations of security breaches and unauthorized disclosure of classified information very seriously. And so an investigation into those leaks began over a year ago, but no charges have been laid in connection with that. At this point, the lawsuit goes on and says that the reckless disclosure of the secret information was designed to create false allegations in public that would influence the Minister of Finance's decision to order Jean to divest his shares in the bank. Christopher Freeland is involved in this, at least on some level, finance minister. So, pretty uh, interesting. There's a picture of the guy. This particular version of the story that I'm showing you here is an example from the mainstream media is from CTV. Man, oh man, that's big money. Let's take a look at um, the website for the bank itself. This is Wealth One Bank. And this looks like they do offer some uh, kind of unique financial products and services. I'm not really that familiar with the company, so I can't really speak to what it is that they do that's a lot different, but I can see just initially from a look at the website that um, they're catering, I think, to 
new Canadians, and I think also maybe the subprime market for loans. And different kinds of investments. And this has done this this case, the leak of the information has not only damaged, I would say, the reputation of the person in question, but also like the founder of the bank, but the bank itself. And as we indicated, the bank has lost some business as a result of the leaked information from CSIS to mainstream media. We're a truly new we're a new and truly unique Canadian bank. At Wealth One it says we don't just approve loans and mortgages, we use the Wealth One common sense lending criteria to help real people with unique situations buy a home, invest in real estate, start or expand a business. So come and tell us your story. We also know how important achieving financial peace of mind is, so we ensure our clients have access to some of the best deposit and guaranteed investment rates to help build wealth and secure their financial future. We're a bank that values relationships and will continue to collaborate and build strategic partnerships to bring innovation and improved offerings to our customers. They are registered. They, they're legit, it seems. I can't say that I have anything to say. I don't have anything to say really about how much value they offer or what level of service they might provide because I just don't know. But they're, it seems they're going after people who get rejected at other banks. So normally, you know, it's kind of like uh, used car dealers. They'll get you financing <laughs> at a higher interest rate. And they'll tell you, oh, we'll help you reestablish your credit. Yeah, for a price. That, see, people talk about financial slavery. That's how you get yourself into uh, a pickle, financially. Yeah. Beware people offering you loans always. Check it out. Make sure the terms are favorable, fair, and in line with market conditions and market values. Okay, well, what else do I have for you tonight? We're kind of, um, you know, strangely, it's a long weekend here in Canada. <laughs> I lost track of the weeks and the days. And uh, one of the Maverick regulars, John, a different John, not the John who calls in all the time, John Rimby called this morning, and I had just woken up. And he said, uh, it's a long weekend. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I forgot that it was a long weekend here in Canada. This is sort of like the May 2-4 weekend, but it's not May 2-4, I guess. Is that right? I don't even know what day of the week it is sometimes because I get so busy. Kind of funny. Anyway, that gets us to about uh, 8.20 p.m. here on the live portion of the, um, the broadcast tonight. Now at 9 p.m., Lori has a special guest on the Strange Bedfellows program, so I'll plug that for her tonight. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to just segue straight into that from this program or not. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to stay on the, the air here and right up until 9 p.m. If not, you'll find Strange Bedfellows on the regular channels starting at 9. So worry not about that. Her special guest tonight is um, Jack Buckby. And the subject is, or the topic, is politics, of course. He's written some book about of what else? You know, it's Laurie. All right? So it's about RFK Jr. And uh, there's an, another issue there, and I haven't seen, or I don't know exactly what, how the interview is going to go, but... Um, I guess he used to be involved in some sort of extreme political groups and has pulled back from some of that, apparently. Can't say for sure. Don't know. Don't know him. 
I'm only really, you know, vaguely familiar with what he has to say or what he's about. So that's her guest. I'm not going to be there tonight. So. And if you're watching on Instagram, the broadcast will probably end very shortly because we are only allowed to broadcast on Instagram live for one hour at a time. So if you are watching over there, you're going to have to come over to Rumble or YouTube to catch the rest of this broadcast. And I think we are still running on Instagram, even though I think we've gone, we've gone over the past hour. Maybe they fixed that issue. Looks like we're still running. We're still live on Instagram. Okay. Used to be we could only run for one hour over there. And we're still waiting to find out what's going to happen with our, uh, our legal concerns that we've directed to Facebook. Because, boy, you know, they, <laughs> they continue to block access to our Facebook accounts but they're leaving the content up. They say that we're banned for life and yet they're keeping the content up. It is incredibly frustrating and it is our position here that Facebook has stolen our property that they are making use of and continue to benefit from the use of our company logo, our company our news organization content, our, um, our branding, the work that was previously done, all the videos still are up. A lot of the stuff is still accessible and they continue to generate traffic. It benefits Facebook having that content on there and we're not allowed to access it. We can't even access Facebook Messenger. And I can see, because they've left the accounts up online, I can see messages in some cases come in, in rare cases. Or I can see that people have messaged, but I can't see what the message is. I can see that people want to get into groups that we had established. Thousands and thousands of people um, who are in our friends lists and in our groups and tens of thousands. Facebook, we had a huge following on Facebook, and they have cut us right off, blocked access. So I sent them a notification, a cease and desist order, and also told them that if they do not, either just delete all the content, but give us access to the files before they do so. Um, if they don't do that, then they have to give us access again because it's our property, ultimately, and they can't just confiscate all of that regardless of their terms of service. I mean, if they don't want us to be on their platform, we don't have to be on their platform. But you can't take somebody's brand, make use of it, continue to generate traffic from it. Now, you see, we have no content, so they're not supposed to be a publisher, and they're protected against legal liabilities and lawsuits and things of that nature based on the content that's published because they're not supposed to be the publisher. They're just a provider of, a, of content, sort of like a phone company, right? They can't, they're not supposed to be able to control what you say over the telephone. But in this case, if they're gonna confiscate the, the intellectual property and the branding and all of the, the, um, the video and the, the still images and everything that goes along with it and the, the written text portion of everything, then they become the publisher. Now they've seized control. They control it. Now they've, they've conti they continue to leave it up published. They're in control of the publishing. They've seized it. They've stolen it. And if they don't release it, we've, I've told them, we'll sue them. So we'll take a look at that. Now, we're, I've, I'm just a little guy trying to sue a giant social media company with more money than the military industrial complex combined. That's not far from the truth. So 
We'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm sure that they don't give a monkey's fart <laughs> about me or my my little cease and desist order because so far we've not had any kind of response. Now, that being said, I think one of the reasons they haven't responded, and some people were asking about this the other night, the reason they likely haven't responded is because I am threatening legal action. So, of course, they're not just going to have some low-level person or an issue or a response or even come back to me with an automated response when there's a potential lawsuit pending. They'll kick that upstairs to somebody a little higher up and maybe to... Um, their legal department. So I'm awaiting a response, and it's been now about a week and a half since I sent that cease and desist order into them. Uh, and all that being said, um, if you want to help us with a donation, we'll we'll put that toward whatever we whatever expenses are we incur as a result of this legal challenge. So. I'll, I'll run the promo now. If I could, if I could get a buck, a dollar, a loony. Yeah, you guys over in the USA, you still have those paper dollars. I miss those so much. Um, <laughs> but I guess the reason our our dollar is now a coin is because it's just pocket change. That's all it's worth in comparison to the U.S. dollar. Okay. So that being said, I'll run this promo and. Yeah, you can support the channel by donating at freedomreporters.com. Let me get that up on the uh, on the screen here for you. I'll run. The New World Order. Government overreach. The Great Reset. Mainstream media lies. Now more than ever, independent voices are needed. Donate now at freedomreporters.com. That's freedomreporters.com. Maverick News. The antivirus program. For your mind. So there's that. And uh, yeah, I'll just throw that up on the screen. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Share this out. Share this out. Share this out. I, people, the streamers always say that, right? Share it out. It's so important. It, well, it helps us if you share it out. It helps the channel. Um, you can you can support us at maverickdonations.com. That's the give, send, go. Uh, you know, I, I say this uh, fairly regularly here on the program. You can also support, support us at freedomreporters.com. And, yeah, if you send us $30 or more, I can send you uh, free of charge to say thank you for the donation, a T-shirt, uh Sixty dollars or more, and I can send you. Um, yeah, we've got Maverick hoodies. Like this, sixty dollars. See hoodies. I'll send you one of those. This one's limited edition, eh? Is this because this one's gray? They're supposed to be only in black, but I guess we got a couple in gray. I don't know how they ended up in the mix. And we have embroidered shirts, too. Um, I know I've got a couple of these polo shirts kicking around here. Uh, only only a few. Uh, but I've got the long sleeve embroidered shirts. Those are the ones I'm really talking about. Oh, and yes, I do still have. Da, 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 about the mobiles. Yes, I do. So if you... Uh, if you order one of those embroidered shirts, I will. Get, while supplies last, a limited number of those 164 scale die cast Batmobiles from Hot Wheels. I have this little supply of them, and I will tuck one of those things in there as a bonus just because they're cool. I thought there's a little bonus we can add. So, yeah. That gets us to 8.30. Okay, so I am kind of running out of steam here tonight, folks. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to wrap it up early this evening. And um, just remind you again to tune in at 9 p.m. for Strange Bedfellows with Lori uh, right here on the Maverick News Network. 
And I will be back tomorrow night. Same news time, same news station. The Maverick News Network. Where we have the antivirus programs for your minds. Catch you on the flip side. This has been a Maverick Multimedia Production.